I do have skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. Welcome back. This week, the United Nations will look into the alleged abuse of children at Lake Alice. Hospital in the 1970s. Specifically, why disgraced Dr. Selwyn Leakes has never been brought to justice. Forty years on, the victims are still asking for a court trial. Is our government persisting in putting its reputation first? Here's Mike Wesley Smith. It's a case like no other. Where would he apply the electrodes? And the genitals was his favourite spot. Have you listened to their stories? Is there any truth to them? Truth? It's a matter of national shame justice take its course. And right up to this present day, he's just destroyed me. A paper trail of allegations dating back 40 years. Last time I would have read this was uh, probably back when I made it. Charlie Symes is reading the statement he gave to a patient rights group when he was just 15, alleging psychiatrist Selwyn Leakes shocked his genitals at Lake Alice Hospital. Which is just straight pain. For a kid, it was a scary place. Uh, scary people. Marty Brandt is another patient of Dr Leakes. Like Charlie, a tough man, once a terrified teen. He applied shock treatment to my genitals, left with uh, permanent burn marks on the underside of my penis. In the end it just wasn't worth saying a damn thing. We just sort of suffered in silence. Kevin Banks was only 14 when he arrived at Lake Ellis, where he too says Leakes shocked his testicles. Still to this day, I'm 60 now, I still can't get over it. Kevin says Leakes also asked him if he'd like to shock another child, a scene captured in these drawings by fellow patient Bruce Harkness. We were offered the availability if we wanted to electrocute me ourselves. I declined the offer, it was something I didn't wish on anybody. I actually saw Dr. Leakes put the electrodes on the genital area. And he started screaming out loud in agony. Leakes has called these claims completely untrue. But according to the United Nations, more than 200 acts of ill treatment and torture happened here, the site of the old Lake Alice Psychiatric Hospital in rural Wanganui. Do you apologise for anything? No, I don't think I do. I think he went too far. I think he got carried away with his own sadism, his own cruelty, and didn't recognise it. Former nurse Brian Stabb worked at Lake Ellis. It's had its own rules, its own staff, and it's very secretive. Leakes would have known that what he was doing was over the top. Brian says Leakes gave electric shocks to children without anaesthetic or consent. The UN says this can constitute torture. It's effective, it's quick, it's life-saving. That was assaultive from the moment the kid was told he was having ECT, dragged up the stairs and he fought and resisted. We've made extensive efforts to contact Selwyn Leakes without success. Are you ashamed by anything you've done? No. Following complaints from children in the 1970s, medical authorities cleared Leakes of wrongdoing and he moved to Australia in 1978. In 2001, Kevin gave an interview to the 2020 program. I believe he'll always have in his heart this evilness. Along with 90 more of Leakes' former patients, in 1999, he filed a class action against the government with lawyer Grant Cameron and they were awarded millions in a compensation settlement. Generally speaking, do you think there was enough evidence to lay a criminal prosecution? Absolutely. Bolstered by their win, Kevin and 54 other patients sent written complaints to police in the early 2000s, hoping Leakes himself would finally be brought to justice. Assistant Police Commissioner Malcolm Burgess headed the police investigation. We'll make an assessment on um, whether a prosecution is um, possible or not. A child psychiatrist told police Leakes' treatments were often very poor or inappropriate. It is, it is unacceptable. And in these circumstances, it's assault. It's grievous bodily harm. But to patients, the police investigation seemed half-hearted. Only one of the 55 complainants was interviewed. No, I never saw the police at all. Yes, it probably does have a lower priority than current matters. An opinion provided to police by the Crown Law Office dismissed Kevin's complaint as a medico-legal issue. 
The Crown Law Office are the government's lawyers. Kevin now wants to know why police got advice from Crown Law on prosecuting Dr Leakes. It's because unbeknownst to him, between 1994 and 2002, Crown Law defended the government against claims of abuse made by other patients against Dr Leakes. Cases that were eventually settled. That meant the allegations were never tested in court. Julian Kincaid is a former prosecutor. There appears to be what it, at best can be described as a conflict of interest. While they were defending the actions of leaks in court, Crown Law investigators obtained 38 witness statements from former Lake Alice staff members. When New Sub Nation asked Crown Law if those statements disclosed any criminal offending, they refused to tell us, citing professional privilege. Crucially, Crown Law did not tell police of the existence of those staff statements and said they advised detectives there was insufficient evidence to charge leaks. To this day, the contents of those statements, including whether or not they contain evidence of crimes, remains secret. Earlier this year, Crown Law opposed our attempts to see evidence given by Dr Leakes in the earlier court cases that were defended by the government. But the court let us see it, and for the first time we can reveal that Leakes left for Australia with the full backing of the New Zealand medical establishment. In his evidence, Leakes said the Medical Council gave him a certificate of good standing. And the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists offered Leakes the directorship of a child psychiatric unit in Melbourne. To uh, recommend him so that he could carry on practicing in, in Australia is also disgraceful. It's a, it's a disgrace. It's a, it's, a, it's a matter of national shame. But in 2006, Lex's past finally caught up with him. Australian medical authorities brought 39 disciplinary charges against him and Lex agreed to retire. But back in New Zealand, the police still refuse to file charges. And right up to this present day, he's just destroyed me. We asked retired detective Dave Pizzini to consider the evidence. We were talking about sustained um, and systematic um, physical and sexual abuse of children. The fact that um, none of those perpetrators have been held to account in the criminal courts is reprehensible. We can reveal two former senior detectives who worked on the Lake Alice investigation in the 2000s have told us they believe that leaks should be prosecuted and that a huge injustice has occurred. We have also obtained this 2006 job sheet from Malcolm Burgess of an interview he did with a former Lake Alice nurse. The nurse said he saw leaks apply the electrodes to the genitals and thighs of a boy in the child and adolescent unit. I don't think any reasonable jury properly directed would come to any conclusion other than it was gratuitous sexual violence. In November 2018, another former patient of Dr Leakes went to police alleging that he had been shocked on the genitals. But he was told in an email by a detective, at this stage police will not be looking into those types of allegations. Following inquiries from New Sub Nation, the man was interviewed early this year, but has not yet heard whether or not Leakes will be charged. There are some people in power that have made some very important decisions along this journey. That, uh, that need to be asked some serious questions about their decisions. Questions that will be asked by the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care, which is now investigating Lake Alice. This case is a disgrace, it's disgusting. Those children were abused three times. They were abused to lead them into having to be at Lake Alice. They have been abused and tortured in Lake Alice and they are abused a third time by the fact that the, the police and crime lawyers who should have made the proper decision to prosecute on their behalf failed to do that. And uh, the prosecution could still be brought, in my opinion. Well, we were going to interview Justice Minister Andrew Little, but he pulled out on advice from his ministry and Crown Law. They said it would be inappropriate for him to comment on a case that will also be considered by the Royal Commission into Abuse in State Care. Meanwhile, Crown Law and the Ministry of Health have told us they would continue to cooperate with police if required. Well, the journalist who's behind that story has been investigating it for three years. Mike Wesley-Smith joins me now. Mike, thanks for your time. Three years? Yeah, I was looking, there's uh, more than 2,000 emails I've sent over that time it's trying to get to the truth on this. Um, I'll, I'll just point out at this stage, the Crown and Ministry of Health acknowledge that these patients were subjected to unacceptable treatment. They right. point out that there's been a settlement, there's been an apology. Also, we tried to contact Malcolm Burgess for that story without success. Um, but yeah, it has been a 
a long road to this point and we still don't know the full picture. Right. And the key players who haven't fronted up are who? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we've approached government ministers, the police, uh, the New Zealand Medical Council, the Royal College, um, Crown Law. None of them wanted to be interviewed. They instead um, sent us some statements, the full contents of which we'll put on online. But, yeah, it, it, to me, I was surprised after all of this time. And, and, and a case of this magnitude, we are talking about 200 alleged acts yeah. of cruel and degrading treatment on possibly torture. And that's why this is so crucial, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, these people, we can't give them their youth back. But what we can do is we can give them the truth of what happened to them. Mm. And basically what their message to, to decision makers is put down your budget analysis, put down the advice you've been getting from Crown Law, and just be guided by the instinct that should exist in all of us, which is ask yourself that question, if this was my eight-year-old, if this was my nine-year-old, what would I want to have happen to them? So do you think that these government departments or these institutions are looking through the lens of just you know, a political and budgetary lens Look at, or a legal lens, <laughs> yeah. not through a human lens? Part of the problem is we don't really know. I mean, much of this material is covered by legal privilege. Mm. You know, these patients, I can tell you what they don't want. They don't want blacked out documents. They don't want people claiming legal privilege. They don't want delays. They just want someone in government to look like they give a damn mm. about what happened to them. And, you know, the apology they got some years ago, they see that as a conditional apology. It was, it was phrased as without a mission of liability. Well, every expert that I've spoken to in the psychiatric profession, the legal profession, law enforcement, I haven't been able to find somebody that can tell me this is legally defensible. OK. So what should the government do to put things right? Well, um, they're up, um, there's a case by a patient brought um, to, before the United Nations um, with the assistance of a patient rights group called the Citizen Commission on Human Rights. They will be asking some questions. One thing that we've noticed, the, the most recent submissions the government made to the United Nations does not include reference to the fact that for almost a decade the government was co-defendants with leaks in civil proceedings. That's a material fact that doesn't form part of their submissions. We've asked them why that was not included. Mm. They have not told us. So I think, really, the, the, the appeal from the patients is just please... Just tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So if they're taking their case back to the United Nations, yes. what can the United Nations do if they do find the, uh, against the New Zealand government? So complaints of this kind for New Zealand are exceedingly rare. In fact, this may be the first one I'm told by, by an expert. The, the committee can't award compensation, but what they oh. can do is they can make a finding that if they believe the investigation has been inadequate, then that is a real, um, that's a very, a, a public statement, particularly from the United Nations, of some significance. Right. And that, um, I don't think the government will, will, will treat such a finding lightly. And I think they, um, I think the patients will hope that they will now, um, yeah, just be a, a bit more of full disclosure to the United Nations. So this has been going on for so long, and yet you know it's un unfolding yet yeah. again next week. Is it? What's happening? Is it next week that this yeah. the UN is considering this? So we just have a time window. We don't have a specific date. We've been told that the case comes back before the Committee Against Torture sometime before the sixth of December. So hopefully, maybe that's an avenue through which some of these patients who've been waiting forty years. Remember, they were kids when this yeah. happened, to them. many of them are approaching retirement age. They just want to know what happened to them. Okay, Mike Wesley Smith, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.